Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that research now shows you that happiness is controlled by a body system and we have some new power to control some more of it. Most of the research around changing your happiness levels points to a concept called hedonic adaptation. It means when something good or bad happens to you over time, you get used to it. And researchers have found that that hedonic adapt- adaptation happens with the majority of good and bad things that happen in your daily life. It exists in your body to help you maintain balance during stress and return you to neutral to keep your stress down. So it's there for your best interests. But they also found in the latest roundup of research is that you control about half your happiness level. And the exact level can vary from person to person, but it looks like about half of it might be genetic or our environment, which they like to call the happiness set point, which by the way, I don't believe in. And about 40 to 50% of our happiness is within our power. Because so much of what we believe is genetic is actually epigenetic or controlled by the environment around us. And that's why I have a hard time when researchers say, oh, it's about 40 to 50%. Like, I just don't believe you. It's probably much higher than that. Much like the people 20 years ago said, cancer is genetic. And now some of the cutting edge cancer researchers that I've interviewed or become friends with will say, we think 2% of cancer is genetic. The rest of it's environmental. So your happiness is environmental and it's also what's going on inside your head, how much trauma you have and stuff like that. And in my own path from being generally pretty cranky and unhappy much of the time to being pretty darn happy, even though I have more on my plate than is sane, um, well, I, I feel like maybe it's more hackable than we like to think. And because you listen to the show regularly, you know that I'm a master of foreshadowing. There might be the chance that we're going to talk about happiness today on the show. What do you think? Of course there is. But before we talk about happiness, if you're a long-time listener, you know today's guest. Her name is Stella Grisant. And she has been on twice, very, very early on the show to talk about happiness. I think an archive edition sometime in the first hundred, if I remember right, and again in the 200s. And today we're going to talk about well, a bunch of different things that have to do with her experience teaching work-life balance and happiness, even at companies like Dow Jones. She's one of the first 150 people to earn a master's degree in applied positive psychology, which you could also call the science of happiness from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is apparently a pretty good school because I went to Wharton after all. So I'm going to give you an extra bonus point there, Stella. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Thank you. So great to be back. You've coached 1,500 leaders in 24 countries, including, uh, and you've, you've keynoted about happiness at Google and VMware and Johnson & Johnson and things like that. Is this because you were really an unhappy, sad person and you thought you would go study positive <laughs> psychology to see if you could undo that problem? Or or is there some other dark story behind why you would do this? Uh- Yes. I mean, actually, that is why (laughs) Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career kind of feeling, you know, I have highs, but then I kept hitting these real lows and feeling really miserable and having just what just literally I remember one time I was watching focus groups because I used to be a brand strategist and you sit in this dark room watching people talk about stuff and I was like stuffing my face with M&Ms just to stay awake. And I just had this moment of like, oh my God, I can't believe this is my life. And I ran to the bathroom. I sat there and I clasped my hands and I literally prayed to God. And I said, there's got to be more than this. And I found myself in that place one too many times. And I really wanted to crack it. Like, what's up with this? How come I keep landing in this place of feeling like there's got to be more? And I keep achieving everything I say I'm going to achieve, but I'm not happy. And so that's why I went to study the science of happiness (laughs) because they say, you know, you, uh, you learn what you, or you teach what you want to learn. And so I'm constantly learning, but, um, but yeah, I've been, I feel like I've, I finally cracked the code 
thank God, because that sucked. <laughs> yeah, achieving, thinking it'll make you happy and then not getting happy sucks. I, I did the same thing in my, my 20s. Yeah. But you came across this. I think a lot of people listening are at that point where you know, you're, you're doing what's supposed to make you happy, mm-hmm. uh, which is you know, your parents told you you have to go to med school or law school or you know, get a degree in whatever. Uh, and you're like, but I don't want to, and it's not what makes me happy. And we have this inherent internal conflict about it. Um, what's your advice for people who are sitting there saying, I don't feel like I'm doing what makes me happy, but I kind of like to eat. Yeah. Um, I have gone to the bottom of a Nutella jar multiple times, (laughs) um, in my misery at work. But that aside, I would say that, um, the big mistake I see people making over and over again, myself included, was that you, you set these goals or you think about, you know, whenever, whenever things suck and we're just not happy, we just want to escape that. Right. So we want to do something completely different and we, and the grass is always greener. So we think, oh, well, if I just change my job or if I just find a new boss, or if I just, uh, finally go do something that I've been really passionate about, then it will be okay. Then I'll be happy. And so we, we have this innate desire to escape when we're feeling really miserable and negative. And so what I first tell people is actually, you know, and, and these aren't my words, but you know, no matter where you go, there you are. And I always tell people, well, no matter where you work, there you are. And so unless you do the inner work first, you can go ahead and find a totally different job or different manager or work in a different department, but it's going to creep back most likely. So if you're miser- if you're a miserable person, <laughs> you can work anywhere and still be a miserable person. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank okay. you. So, um, and so what we want to do first is figure out how do I want to be and then set goals from that. So just to kind of break it down, you know, often I think when we come up with our goals or what we want to achieve or what we want to do next, we're using what I call backward logic. So we're either determining where we want to go based on the opposite of a negative experience we have, or we, we choose something that sounds right. Like that our, you know, our parents tell us to do, or that society tells us is important. Um, so it's about money or about title, or it's about things that sound right. But the thing is what sounds right doesn't always make us feel right. And so what I encourage people to first actually do is to think about how do I want to be, how do I want to feel and let that be the destination that you, you, you kind of see, and then you work backwards and figure out your goals from that. So the cool thing about that is that when you focus on how you want to be, so let's say it, creative or collaborating with people I'm inspired by or having freedom and flexibility of my schedule. When you focus on those things, what you start to realize is that there are actually infinite ways or more ways than you thought of to achieve that. And so what I encourage people, if you're feeling stuck or crappy in your place right now, let's get clear on that stuff first and see what you can do to influence your reality now, because there's actually more options and possibilities for you than you can see right now. Um, and so, and, and also when you're, I'm going to like geek out when you're in a negative mindset and when things aren't going well, the problem is that our vision literally and figuratively is impacted. So we know from research that when you're experiencing negative emotions, you literally do not see the big picture. Like your eyes do not scan an image all the way. Your eyes tend to focus on one particular part of an image. And the same thing with your reality. If you're in a negative place, there may be solutions like right there, but you're not seeing them because you're cutting it off. Your emotions are cutting off those opportunities. So does that answer? (laughs) It does answer it. In fact, it matches some of the advice uh, that's in Game Changers. Um, there's yeah. a uh, there's a law, a never discover who you are. And, and, yeah. it, and it's that the people who've gone on to change the game in their respective fields uh, generally don't just discover it. They decide who they want to be, and then they move yes. in that direction. So, yes. So what's the difference then between someone saying, I, 
I'm not going to be a miserable person. Like, is that strategy going to work or is there a better way to do it? Well, when you're framing how you want to be, I always encourage people, first of all, to do it in the positive. So it's right. So it's not, I don't want to be miserable. It's, I want to be, um, content or I want to be peaceful or I want to be inspired or whatever it is. So, um, so then, yeah, I think that's totally legit. Like you, one thing that's missing when we set our, one way that we easily slip when we make, um, when we set goals is it's called moral licensing. So let's say we're on our way to kind of doing things that we really want to do. And maybe it's being on the bulletproof diet, right? So like we're on the bulletproof diet, we're doing really well, not having, you know, extra sugar, having our coffees. And then, you know, someone brings in a piece of chocolate cake that, has a lot of white sugar. And, you know, you've been on the diet for five days and you think I've been really good. So I deserve to be a little bit bad. And that's called moral licensing. And the way that we can get out of moral, the way we can kind of hack our own brains and not give into that temptation, which we all have is by reminding ourselves of who we are, what kind of person we are. And so that's when it, it's really helpful to say, well, I'm the kind of person who can stick with my goals, or I'm the kind of person who is vital and strong and super healthy. Isn't that like perfectionism by another name? Oh, I'm not the kind of person who would have the chocolate cake. Yeah, that's a really good, I mean, that's a really good catch. This isn't about being perfect. In fact, when I make my mistakes, I'm always I have to remind myself of like past experiences when I have been that person because I, I know that I'm not going to be that person a hundred percent of the time. I know I'm going to mess up, but every new second is a new moment to be, you know, who you want to be. So just kind of move that, that, on and, you know, that was one of again. the, one of the disruptive things about the bulletproof diet, aside from the fact that it's like, Hey, saturated fat has a role in your body. Um, it, it was that it's, it's presented as a roadmap. So you're always in a neighborhood and you're still the same person. And you're like, today I'm kind of in a sketchy neighborhood, but you don't, you can't really go off the roadmap uh, because, well, you're going to be eating something, right? And you just realize, okay, maybe I can you know, move, move up in the world or move down in the world, but that it isn't so binary, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so then you can say, I'm going to become the kind of person who, when I have a choice, I make the better choice, even if it's not yes. the perfect choice. And, and I think it set a lot of people free. And this came from my own experience as a 300 pound angry person, uh, you know, going through that saying, I'm not going to eat the cookie. And then you just eat half the cookie by the end of the meeting because the meeting was so boring, you might as well eat the cookie or whatever the other reason was. Yeah. And, and then you're, you're sort of like, God, what's wrong with me? You're like, well, you know, I made a, made a bad decision, but I didn't eat the whole cookie, right? So <laughs> I still made a better decision. This wasn't the best decision. And just yes. having that framing for me was, was really helpful. And just realized there's going to be times when I, quote, cheat, but I could you know, jump off a cliff cheat or I could just, you know, do something that wasn't really as good as it could have been, but yes. you know, satisfied that craving for whatever it was. Is there a word for that in happiness research? I call that appreciation, like, because actually one of the things I encourage my clients to do at the end of the day is once you've gotten clear on how you want to be, and we distill that down into values, I ask my clients to check in on how did they actually perform on those values during that day. And so let's say if one of your choices is to be healthy or be bulletproof, um, then you can ask yourself, in what ways was I bulletproof today? And I would say that eating half the cookie instead of the whole cookie was your way of expressing that value. So it's about appreciating what progress you're making and not judging the progress. So that I think really sets a lot of people free. Like it set you free. It's like, I'm not going to judge how much I did, or like maybe I didn't change the whole world today, but I made these few choices that were in alignment with how I wanted to be. Yeah, so you can find something something to be grateful for. And you know, and I think our listeners have probably heard, but maybe haven't heard recently, this idea that we're heavily biased towards avoiding negative things because the way we're where negative things might be a tiger that would eat you and then you're dead. So you should yeah. really over-bias that. But then it's so easy to forget the positive things. So yes, you ate the chocolate cake or whatever, 
Um, but you, you might have also you know saved someone from a burning building, but you're yes. probably going to remember the chocolate cake more than the burning building unless you also got burned. And I, <laughs> like, yes. well, it, it, that, that just sucks. Is there anything we can do uh, programmatically or, or like you're saying uh, in, in the evening that allows people to better remember the good stuff and to maybe devalue the bad stuff? Do you have yeah. anything besides what you just mentioned? Yes. Well, the neg- that's the negativity bias that you're talking yeah. about. And so we have to hack the negativity bias. And so the way that, um, so one of the exercises is to really reflect and appreciate, you know, what are those things that you did? And it's like a muscle, you know, when you practice, you will literally start seeing more and more more ways that you are expressing your values, more ways that you're being who you want to be. Um, I do also, I do a loving kindness meditation. I actually do it in the morning, not in the evening. And so when I, when I wake up, what I will do, and for those of you guys who don't know what loving kindness meditation is, it's a, it's a Buddhist practice, which basically is just, you're wishing other people well, and you're wishing yourself well. And I really love it as a go-to, especially when I have a hard time just being quiet. It's a form of meditation where I can like focus my thoughts, but also have them like beam goodness. (laughs) So it kind of does two things at once. And I do find when I do this, that I have a much better day. I find strangers like smiling at me more. I get like free things randomly. It's just... If I really plug into my loving kindness meditation, it really unlocks a lot of stuff. And there's a lot I can, a lot more we can get into about it. But do you teach, do you teach your clients, like when you're working with a senior executive, do you say, all right, wake up in the morning and beam loving kindness at the world? I actually do. (laughs) how, How do they respond to that? We're usually in it and it usually comes up because they're dealing with a toxic work environment or they're dealing with a very difficult personality. Um, And so they just, they've tried everything. They've tried to have conversations with this person. They've um, talked to other leaders about this person. And this person's making their life miserable. And uh, before, I recommend, before you have any additional big conversations or moments with this person, the one thing that I I recommend people do is to do a loving kindness meditation. And I know it sounds really woo woo and whatever on that person specifically, like like send that person. I include them. Okay. I include them. So the way it works, a loving kindness meditation is you usually like you start thinking about someone who is very easy for you to love. So for me, I think about my daughter. Mm -hmm. So I, I envision her. And then what I'll do is I'll, you know, may you be healthy. May you be happy. May you be safe. May you be free to be yourself. Like whatever you can come up with your own combo of like well wishes. Like and may you be free to be yourself at some other company. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll just be like, you know, I want just you to kidding. feel true to who you are. That's what I mean. And cause I think that's so important for us. And then I will, then I'll shift my attention to like my husband or I'll shift it, you know, to whoever. And then I'll, I'll go person by person, I'll do my team, and then I'll kind of, just because it's gonna take forever, I'll start collectively envisioning people, so I'll do like a group, and then what I'll do is I'll, anybody who I encounter, so I did this for you, Dave, I did this for all the listeners, so I, I really just, I try to envision like really beaming goodness, and the reason why it's so important, and I recommend it, first of all, there's research on this, that it can actually transform, um, take you in six weeks of doing loving kindness meditation, you have greater life satisfaction, you can reverse signs of depression. So there's all this great research on it. Uh, but also what, how it's so important is that our emotions are contagious, right? There's something called, um, emotional contagion. So like your emotions, like, just like if you sneeze and you, can spread the flu, your mood can be transmitted to others. And so if you're having a hard time with someone, I always want my clients to be what I call like immune to the toxicity. And the best way for you to do that is one, to be clear on who you want to be, because if you're not clear on that, then it's very easy to get lost Mm -hmm. in all the 
the stuff because if someone's toxic or they have stuff going on, that stuff penetrates you. And then you can't tell, is this mine or is this, is this theirs? And you start to question yourself. I, I think everyone listening has had at least one circumstance at work, at least if you've had a job uh, where you have someone toxic. But yeah. what does that actually mean? Because I think different people might use that word toxic in different levels. So like, how do you know you're dealing with a toxic person or is it just someone you really don't like? I think it's a t toxic situation when you're not able to perform in the way that you want to perform. So you're debilitated in some way because maybe you're feeling emotionally unsafe around this person. You're feeling like whatever's happening between you is getting in the way of your showing up and being your best. And the thing is that we pay so much attention to what we consume, right? Especially your listeners in terms of what we put in our bodies, but are we paying as much attention as to the people we're surrounding ourselves by and the thoughts and emotions we're having as a result of those interactions? And so I want people to be really conscious of, you know, there's also, we all have responsibilities. So sometimes we're contributing to whatever that situation is. And so I always encourage people to kind of look, how can I look at this differently? How might I take responsibility for my part? But I just think it's so important to, you know, the number one thing I talk about in communication is not what you say, but it's how you're saying it. And it's the energy that you're showing up with. And so if you want to break through that passive aggressive madness that you're having, or you want to really connect deeply or just power through regardless of the shit around you, then it's really important for you to be grounded in who do I want to be? How can I show up as that person? And how can I just blast this whole situation with love? And that's, I think, where really miraculous things start to happen and it gets really juicy. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, like, I've seen my client, like I had a client who would literally schedule time in her day to cry because she was so miserable at work. She was a big executive. She is a big executive. She was at the company for 11 years. Uh, what decided to go on to a different team because she wanted a new challenge. This boss ended up being a super micromanager Suddenly she went from being this empowered leader to feeling extremely insecure and having no autonomy. And I talked to her about, well, let's script out a conversation you can have with him. And she was really resistant. She's like, he's not going to get it. He's not the kind of person who understands. It's just going to make things worse. So whenever we're dealing with a toxic situation, we're always afraid to kind of speak up for our needs and because there's a big risk. And she just assumed he wouldn't get it. And when we did her, we, you know, we did the vision generator, which is by the way, an exercise I'd love to give to you guys. If you need help figuring out how you want to be, you can download this free tool visiongenerator.com. And so she did that work. And one of the values that emerged from that is that it was important for her to be a champion for others. And so I said, okay, Cheryl, how, so one of her values is being a champion for others. And I said, how are you being a champion for yourself in this moment? And that's the, that's the reason why we want to do our values is it's how we can hold ourselves accountable to being who we want to be. And we have to be that for ourselves first. And so she realized she had to be brave and she had to be a champion for herself and have this conversation, but she was doing all this work in the meanwhile. And she booked, you know, her next one-on-one, -on -one, she had a conversation with him and took 20 minutes. She got put onto a new project. She had the autonomy she wanted. And she said, Stella, I'm not coming to work and crying every day. So things can transform rapidly if we're willing to really do that inner work. Okay. So what she did is she sent loving kindness beams from her heart to the, to her boss who was micromanaging her. She got clear on her uh, like her, who she wanted to be using yes. the vision generator, uh, uh tool that yes. you've got. Uh, she did those two things, which led her to have a conversation for 20 minutes that got her put on a new project. Yes. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't, it's like we, she spent so much time 
feeling anxious and having resistance to actually doing what she needed to do. But it was so much simpler than she imagined. That sounds pretty easy. She's a big exec, so she probably has enough money that if she loses her job, which is the downside of having that uncomfortable conversation, uh, that she probably could get another job before she ran out of money and lost her house and stuff like that. It, it, it seems like there's a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck. And I don't mean you know people who are just starting out in their careers. There are a lot of people my age living paycheck to paycheck now um, in the US. Uh, and it's... It, you know, even even people who are you know executives sometimes it's just expensive to live in a big city now. Yeah. And so there, there's that anxiety, like, like okay, I really want to show up, but I'm miserable in my job because I'm afraid that if I show up, I'm not going to have this job. How do you how do you coach people around that? Yeah. Well, I think before you have the conversation, and what Cheryl did was really start to practice being who she was. And that meant showing up as the leader that she wanted to be. And so what you start to do in the process before you approach any kind of conversation, by going through the work of clarifying who you want to be and then taking action to be that way, you start to become a more valuable player. And often what happens to many of my clients is they actually don't even need to have the conversation because somehow their boss or their coworkers start acting differently towards them without them even actually having the conversation. And that's because they're showing up differently because emotions are contagious. If I am constantly in the office feeling like a victim of my circumstances, like, Oh, they're taking advantage of me and, um, they're giving me too much work and, um, they're, oh, they're not respecting me or they're not giving me what I deserve or I'm angry and I'm pissed off, whatever it is. If we're feeling all that and that's what we're obsessing about, that gets transmitted. And so no one feels really good on it. And this is all happening, happening on a very subconscious level. We're receiving that information. We're, tr we're transmitting that. Other people are receiving it. And no one really wants to like be in your corner when you're full of resentment or pity or you're not coming from your most empowered place. But when you start acting like the badass that you are, then people want to align behind you and support you and open the door for you to be successful. So by the time you actually have that conversation, you're a different human being and people will respond differently to you. Especially if you're doing loving kindness, you're not coming in there from the perspective of I'm going to have a confrontation. You're coming in there from the perspective of let's have a conversation. And I, I talk to people about how to master difficult conversations like, you know, and, and what to say and all that. But it really starts with your energy. What's the first thing that someone should do when they you know, they they come home from work and there's a new employee, new boss, uh, you know, new coworker, uh, and you're like, oh my god, I I think this person's a psycho, <laughs> or you know, whatever. They're a micromanager. Yeah. They're you know a, a bad human being who's spreading darkness. Uh, whatever yeah. your inner dialogue is, what like the second you have that inkling, what's the first thing that you, as a happiness coach, tell people to do? Well, you don't. You know, I always say, well, one, I'm always like, how can you look at this differently? And I'm always asking people to leave space for the unknown, right? Because we never really know. We don't really know what's going on with anyone. We don't know. You know, um, one of my clients thought her boss was being like a super just he was being really mean, to put it lightly. And she's a doctor. And um she was complaining about him to me. And I said, well, you, you never know what's going on. And then it turned out two weeks later, um, she discovered that his wife was suffering from breast cancer. And so people are bigger than their behaviors. And so I always encourage you to really try to understand where this person is coming from, really get to know them. And we all have flash judgments. We all do. We, we're always judging. That's just the way our brain works. But to know that that isn't our truth and that is not the truth. Right. And so just to notice those thoughts and, you know, I know you encourage meditation. Meditation is a really great way to create space in between those instinctual judgy thoughts and, you know, to really create space for 
another possibility, another way of looking at this. And so I really just try to encourage people, you know, go out for lunch, ask them questions like, what gets you energized? What are you excited about doing? Um, tell me about where you came from and how you got here. That, that seems a little bit Pollyanna. Okay. It, so someone comes into your company and you're like, actually, <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, that, you know, this new coworker is after my job or you know, whatever it is. And you're saying, okay, maybe I'm wrong. So, so you, yeah. you go through that and you're like, actually, I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah, but like, well, if you're not wrong, hey, it's legit. No, right. so, 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 so if you're not you're, wrong, what? How do you handle the misery then? Because, because yeah. I mean, you've you've stated on your social media and all that stuff, you know, that huge numbers of people um, are miserable in their current jobs. In fact, what percentage would you say? I mean, you, you probably have the research. Well, we know that um, it's about eighty percent worldwide, and in the United States, it's about seventy percent of people are miserable in their jobs. They're unengaged, which means oh, okay. they're checked out. So it's a range of it's a range of like you know just bored to like straight up miserable. Okay, got it. A range somewhere in there. So this is happening a lot. And yeah. Like, all right, maybe it's me, which is part of it. Maybe it's the way I'm framing the situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, maybe the other person has something going on, and you can engage, which is a very healthy behavior. But I think some of the time, like, okay, other people just have, you know, they have their stuff. And and I, I've seen this multiple times in my career where you get the wrong person in at the wrong level and just things go sideways, right? It's like a yeah. chaos generator. So yeah. that can also drive misery. Uh, oh, in, in totally. What do you recommend people do in that situation? So one, I would recommend that you're always documenting everything. So if you start to feel like someone is really sabotaging your growth and is really threatening to your success at an organization. And, um, you want to start documenting everything from comments they made at a meeting, keeping emails if they're really abusive. So you want to have a paper trail and if it gets really bad, you should, or even before it gets bad, I always, the first thing I always try to do is to have an an authentic exchange with this person and have them really understand their impact on you if you feel safe enough. And if you've, if, and I would recommend maybe you get some support and coaching on maybe how to have that constructive conversation. But I always try to talk directly first with the person and see if them, because sometimes people don't know how they're affecting others. They just really have no clue. And so just to share, hey, you know, when we were in that meeting last week, and I was speaking and then you started talking about a different topic that made me feel like my voice didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that made me for the rest of the day, I found myself feeling very distracted as a result of it and questioning whether or not uh, we're on the same page. So what would be really great is if when I'm speaking about this, this theme next week, could you hold off your, your thoughts until I'm done? That would make me feel a lot more supported. So first start with them. If that doesn't work, talk to your boss and then, you know, keep escalating it. Hopefully you're not in a situation where you're in harm's way. Um, because if you are, that really needs to be escalated to another resource, whether if it's not HR to a lawyer, to the police department, if things are, are really serious, but, um, don't stay. I would always recommend to, to not stay quiet and just power through because if you're in a really bad situation, it's going to end up getting to you and affecting your performance. I think that's, that's powerful advice. And it's probably more than your performance because, uh, as a lot of people know, I've been, uh, pretty public uh, in a few of the, the big magazines now. I'm planning to live to at least 180 years old. And uh, I'm also planning to be highly functioning when I'm 180, not, you know, putting my car keys in the refrigerator. And that's, that's not my, uh, not my goal. <laughs> so I know that, that happiness is intimately tied to performance because game changers, those were the big three things that came out of it. The people who kick the most ass found a way to be happy, which helped them kick ass, not the other way around. Uh, but I also know uh, from my longevity research that that happiness, including happiness at work, but happiness everywhere else is a part of longevity. Yeah. Do you have any data? Do you, do you do any work around that with your clients around their health or longevity as a result of increasing their happiness at work? 
Well, we, we do know that if, um, if you are a more positive, happy person, you're twice as likely to be alive after the age of 60 than your negative counterparts. So that's like amazing and huge. Is it the same for men and women? I believe so because there was one study that was done on men and then there was another study that was done on women, on nuns. There's a, it's called the nun study. And so, uh, what they did is they found these nuns who were like writing essays when they, before they became nuns and they actually like coded their, their, their letters with, you know, pot, you know, if they, the more positive words versus negative words. And then they, they looked around and they saw who was still alive and those who happened to have a more positive letters at the onset or more positive words describing their life at the onset were twice as likely to be alive. So, and then they did this also with a group of men. I believe they were Mexican men. I don't, I don't remember the name of that study, but yes. So you are much more likely to be alive if you're more positive and happy. You've seen the movie Grumpy Old Men, right? Yes. Uh, and it's kind of a stereotype of grumpy old men. And it's also a perfect description of testosterone deficiency syndrome in men. And, and one of the things that drives grumpiness and lack of longevity, uh, at least in males as we age, is that our testosterone goes through the ground and then we become cranky and you become less happy. <laughs> so there's an interesting thing. Is it the lack of testosterone like a young person would have that's killing you or is it that's also driving your lack of happiness or is it the testosterone drove the lack of happiness that increased stress that killed you no one's ever done that that research that i've seen but i i think they're intimately linked uh, and certainly we know things like oxytocin which makes you live longer that comes from happiness and culture and, and, and things like that so i i think it's a, a twisted mass of things but i'd be shocked yeah. if the numbers were exactly the same for men and women uh, just because of the way our emotional and hormonal systems work as we age. Oh my God. I mean, I have been doing a lot of research on hormones and cause I know my mood and my cycle are so synced and it's crazy how every month I will forget why am I so cranky right now? Why do I feel like the world sucks? And then I'm like, Oh, I look at my cycle and I'm like, yes, this is happening on schedule. And so, um, and I've done a lot of, or I'm doing a lot of hacking to, to improve it. And I think it's helping, but check, check out, yeah. uh, Jolene Brighton. Uh, she was okay. on a, a while back talking about a cycle sinking. I just wrote a, a blog post on that. And, yeah. um, the idea is that, uh, there are certain activities for women that are, you'll just be more successful at them at certain times of your cycle because your hormones are in alignment with you know, cognitive yes. function and when you do heavy exercise and all sorts of stuff. She's she's done some really cool stuff. There's a, a few others in the field, but yeah, Elisa Vidi I think was also on your yes, show. Yes, she was indeed. Yeah. Uh, Elisa, yeah. uh, Elisa and uh, uh, and Jolene are two that I would go to. And just yeah. for everyone listening, this is meaningful stuff. And if you're saying, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm a guy there's a pretty good chance uh, that you have women in your life <laughs> close to you uh, and, and that's affecting you. And so I, I appreciate that we can have just adult conversations about that. And certainly, I mean, I'm married. Like there are times like, wow, today's just kind of a shitty day. And uh, you could have something to do with, with the calendar. And it's, it's just something that you could acknowledge. Yeah. It also makes it easier to feel loving kindness and forgiveness and all that towards someone. Yes. You're like, oh, that's what's going on. Okay. And also to yourself as a woman to be like, oh, you know, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's not my life. It's just like what's happening for me. Um, Alisa, she's a friend of mine. She actually has a really great app that I use and you can actually share it with your partner. So he knows where I am on my cycle as well, which I love. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I haven't yeah. done the app version of that, but uh, um, my wife and I wrote a fertility book. So we're we're pretty yeah, down I on read that it. Stuff. I read it before we had, uh, or as I was pregnant. What a funny thing! And four, now you have a four-year-old. Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> well, have you seen that being a a parent has changed any of your happiness awareness research, uh, the way you work with clients, and just what what you tell people? You know, what's the saying? You wear your heart on your sleeve now, or no? Like your your heart is like outside of your body and walking around. Um, I remember shortly after having my daughter, I was watching commercials about like, um, about animals 
and I suddenly was just like crying. And I don't think it was just the hormones. I think any time now, I, I've just become, I've become a greater activist. I've become a greater advocate for anyone who doesn't have a voice. I just feel like I've, be, my heart has grown exponentially since becoming a parent. Like I almost feel I feel a mothering towards like the world. And I feel that's such a privilege that other, you know, moms, I, I just feel like once you become a parent, you just care on a different level. And at least that's been my experience. And so, um, it's given me so much more empathy and so much more empathy for my clients who are parents and trying to juggle it all. But I feel feel like it's, um, it's just blown my heart wide open. And that's been an amazing, it's helped your, your happiness kind of in general. I mean, yeah, the first year it, <laughs> I was miserable. Like I was <laughs> miserable. I was, tell it I like was, it is the first year I sucks. Was, <laughs> I was banging my head against the wall. Like I literally hurt my head because I was so sleep deprived. And I thought, you know, this can't be it. Like I'm doing something wrong or this, this sucks. Like I was, I was in the lowest of lows and, and also the highest of highs. And, um, I think sleep deprivation has a lot to do with it, but, but in terms of how, um, what it's helped me do is I think I used to always worry about success and, you know, being, I, in my early, in my twenties, it was all about like, doing amazing things. And again, like setting these goals that sounded right. But being a parent has just grounded me in such a way of like, people are what matter most. And we know from the research that the number one predictor of our happiness are our relationships. And I know you wrote about that in your Game Changers book about community and really valuing those around us. And having Lenore has just driven that home and grounded me so much more. And it's so much easier to like, let go of the bullshit because you know, what really matters most is the people. And I've, that's, that's my uh, driving force. So, so it, it definitely made a difference, uh, for, uh, f for your coaching practice then, which, yeah. What, yeah. what advice would you have for people? And it's, it's interesting. We have more people having children later in life, and we have more people just not having children than really in, in all of history as a percentage, partly because of fertility problems because of what we've done to our environment, uh, and just partly that people are choosing it for careers or just saying, yeah, it's, it's crowded enough. You know, I, I think I want to go uh, party instead of have a year of sleep deprivation, um, all of which are, are valid. Uh, but what advice would you have for people at work uh, on how to maintain you know, their their own happiness, you know, and how, how to have a healthier environment around them uh, when their coworkers uh, or their friends uh, go out and start families. Because I, I hear this from people like work life for the parents shift, but work life for the coworkers shift, and it can be a destabilizing thing in companies. Um, but it's also just a healthy, normal part of life. So now you've been on both sides of that, and you coach yeah. CEOs and these big executives. So yeah. what advice do you have from both sides of that? I will say when I became a mom or even when I just got pregnant, I was mortified at how bad American organizations are at supporting families. I really felt it. Like I didn't, I didn't get it before, but just having morning sickness and I didn't have to hide it because I own my own company. But I thought about all the women who felt the way I felt and had to show up in an office and pretend like nothing was happening. I was like, I can't believe that's what so many women do. Um, also because they're fearing job security. Um, and so one, I just, I mean, I know this isn't exactly what you asked, but I just feel like we could all do so much more um, in terms of having compassion for, for families. Uh, the in terms of, I think it's a value shift, you know, in America, we're just all about the productivity, which is super important. But I think that's also a big reason why we're so unhappy in America and why our happiness as an, uh, as a country is not growing. In fact, it's, it's, it's kind of flat. Um, 
And we're not even in the top 10 when it comes to most happy uh, countries in the world. And I think it's because we're not valuing relationships and families are one of the biggest frameworks of relationships in our, in our country. And so, like you said, there's people who are living paycheck to paycheck and they have to make ends meet. And that means not giving your family all that you want to give. So that sucks. And that creates pressure for everyone. Um, so I think it's about leadership at organizations really creating the space and the language to say, this is happening. And how do we celebrate and support these people? How do we create infrastructure to support these folks rather than put pressure on moms to come back to work in three weeks and pretend like everything is fine while they're still recovering and their bodies are, you know, still healing. So I think it's on the, the leadership to create more space for recognizing, oh, like people have families and we're humans and, you know, that. I had a conversation with uh, my executive team actually last week and just, just to reset priorities, uh, everyone, people always say the customer comes first and we, we value that very highly at Bulletproof, but I'm like, but that's actually not correct. Here's what comes first your personal health as a human being. Because yes. you're not gonna show up for our customers or anyone else. So the order of priority uh, in my companies is uh, your health, because you don't throw that away, right? Yeah. Number one. Number two is your family. Because if you have a true family emergency, if someone is dying, if someone's giving birth, you don't get a second do-over on that. You drop everything and you and you take care of your family, right? Yes. And work is a close third. <laughs> Right? Yes. And that is what best serves the customer. It's what best serves you. It's best what, yes. it's what best serves the world around you. But I think a lot of companies have this uh, just in the wrong order where, you know, they're willing to burn themselves out or, uh, you know, do things that are frankly unnatural <laughs> in order unnatural. to meet these goals. Yeah. Yeah. Unnatural. And, and it's not sustainable. It's not good for business. What I think it's one out of eight visits to the doctor's office is due to stress at work. Wow. So it's, it's not hurting. It's, it's not, it's not a win-win for anyone when we don't recognize our own humanity and create systems that support that. And, you know, when it comes to the toxic work culture that we were talking about before, I think it's because, you know, there's these conflicting values and it's great that your organization's values are super clear and ranked, which I think is missing from a lot of teams and organizations. But you know, there's this, we have to achieve kind of no matter what. And, you know, meanwhile, people might be struggling with what's going on at home. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got one sort of summary question for you. I really want people to, to have the, the Cliff's notes for how do you stay bulletproof in a toxic work environment? So give me the three to five steps that that a listener could could follow the saying, God, I'm in a toxic work environment, uh, whatever that means to them. Kind of walk me through five things or three things, whatever it is. Okay, I love it. All right. So the first thing I would do is you have to get clear on what is your own unique definition of success in terms of what does it look like when you're thriving? What does it look like when you're your most alive? And so that's why I have people do the vision generator. So you guys can just go there. It's a quick, uh, quick ish exercise to do. It's a fill in the blank, but it will help you define how, how do you want to be and exist in this world? Because everything starts from there because you need to be who you want to be no matter what happens. And you actually have control over that. So that's first. The second thing I would do is to develop a gratitude practice if you don't already have one. And I would, you know, before you go to bed at night, just think about three to five things you're grateful for in your life at work. And because we know that helps you be more resilient, it helps you see beyond your negativity bias and you have to develop that muscle. The other thing that I would do is is to start acting 
in alignment with how you want to be. So that means really being clear on your choices, micro choice by micro choice. So if you want to be in a work environment that is more positive, how can you be a more positive force? Maybe you decide to kick off your meetings and ask everyone what they're grateful for. Maybe you bring in um, lunch or you bring in coffee for folks. Like maybe you write a thank you note to someone. So how can you be a positive force despite what is happening? Uh, So you start acting in alignment with how you want to be. And then I would say once you're being who you want to be, really think about your options in terms of what conversations you want to have and with who um, and what are the needs that you really need met. And I think that only becomes clear to you once you start practicing how you want to be. And I just like to always you know, meditation, I think is always good to throw in there because that helps you also have more awareness of the choices in front of you and not take things personally because when there's a toxic work environment, you, that negative energy can really kind of penetrate and having a meditation practice or any kind of mindfulness practice just makes you aware that, oh, that's not my crap. And you can choose not to let that totally invade. Uh, That's uh, that's beautiful advice. And it's funny, that's the same advice that helps people be more bulletproof or or more resilient uh, the rest of the time, uh, even if they're not in a toxic work environment. So those are best practices. And yeah, those are reflected in in Game Changers. And one of the reasons I I wrote the book the way I did is it's easy to say, oh, I heard Stella say it, so it must be true. But if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I'm, you know, 25 years older than Stella. Uh, I'm a man, <laughs> and you know, I, I have a completely different background. You could say what works for Stella probably isn't going to work for me, or maybe it will, but you, you just don't know. But when you realize that a bunch of people who have who have achieved that certain level of changing their game, they generally all agree on these things, or they all put these into practice, or or a majority of them do. You could just have more safety. Uh, and and more trust that when you decide to do this list of things, you have a greater likelihood of success if more than one person uh, says that they're useful. And so this is a way of, of lowering risk because the risk anyone listening who's who's consciously thinking about it is, well, it's going to take some amount of energy and time and trust and whatever else in order to follow this advice. And if there's if it doesn't work or it moves me backwards, I don't get that time and energy back. So like maybe we can de-risk it for you a little bit, and and that's is that mindset. But I got to say, you you nailed it, and you've looked at because you're a positive psychology <laughs> person. I mean, you've looked at hundreds and hundreds of studies, so you're standing on the backs of giants plus coaching fifteen hundred uh, CEO types uh, and all this. So it passes the sniff test on every level, whether you want to talk about it from a scientific perspective or a spiritual perspective. It doesn't really matter. We have data, and uh, we have. Uh, practice and we have anecdotal evidence and we have statistics. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that your list is, is valid and worthy of consideration. Well, otherwise I wouldn't have you on the show. (laughs) Well, thank you. And the thing is, I think it's not, it's not like this is like shocking stuff, right? Everyone who's listening knows that it's important to, you know, count your blessings or to be grateful or to meditate. Like we all know this stuff. And I think that challenge is like, are you doing it? And it's a really about sitting down and doing this stuff because, you know, we all know how to lose weight. We all know we it's like, it's not about knowing it's about doing. And so even though this stuff seems super simple, it works if you just do it. So I want to encourage anyone to just start with like a gratitude journal or download like a free loving kindness meditation uh, or just, you know, do the vision generator, just start with one thing and notice what you notice. And that momentum will start to build. And, you know, your situation might transform much more easily than you can even imagine now. That, that really makes, uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And I have one more question for you, Stella, unrelated to all this other stuff, except maybe the basics of happiness. I'm starting to ask other people to reconsider 
aging. Because I'm tired of hearing when I say I'm going to live to 180. I expect people to go, that's cool. How could I do it? And a lot of times people say, oh my God, I can't imagine what I would look like at that age. Uh, don't sign me up. Like I'm out. And, and I don't understand that mindset. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask you this. How old do you think you you can you can get to? Like how old do you think you'll live? How long do you think you'll live? I've actually never thought about that. Um, you know, in there's, I don't know, like my family's Russian, so we're always like making toast till 120. There and also go. like, so we're always like saying till 120. You're saying 180 was like, that's really cool. I thought, oh, maybe we should up it. Like when you first said it, I was like, whoa, I've never even gotten there. So I love it. And I think that the, the key is to like live, young as long as possible. That's when I think about vitality, because I'm always seeing at the gym, these much older women, like really like kicking ass in, in the, in the exercise class. And I'm like, that's how I want to be. So I'm always looking at these really old women who are vivacious. And that's what drives me when I think about the choices that I make every day about my well-being, I'm like, is this going to propel me into being that kick-ass old lady? So I never think about the number so much, but I do want to be that kick-ass older woman. All right. So you want to perform well when you're old and your family does 120. If it makes you feel better, 180 is pretty simple math. I know we can do 120 because we have evidence. We have people who are well-documented yeah. to be 120. Yeah. And they didn't do anything special. And you and I have the ability to do something special. So yeah, That's we could probably true. do 120. I love it. And Great. I'm pretty sure that we can get a 50% improvement in the next 80 years of medical research. If we can't extend our lives by 50%, it's because we're not trying. So that, that's my incredible scientific I analysis. will happily go there with you. <laughs> All right. It's a deal. <laughs> Stella, thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. Uh, your uh, website is visiongenerator.com. And I'm really hoping that listeners got, uh, got some really cool thoughts about how you deal with a toxic work environment and the nature of happiness. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. So, so grateful to be here again. Thanks. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. You can share it with a friend or you can pick up your copy of Game Changers because I promise you it'll have a higher return on investment for you than even this interview. And while you're at it, if you haven't had a chance to share gratitude, which will make you happier, the fastest and easiest way to do that is to go to Amazon and leave a review of Game Changers. Because guess what? I will be grateful when I see that five-star review, and I'll actually read it, so I'll know what you thought. So tell me what you thought about the book. Go to Amazon, leave a review. Thank you.